So welcome everybody. I'm Sonia Broad and I'm with the University of California Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. I'm coming to you today from the city of Davis, which occupies land that has been home to the Patuan people for thousands of years. Today, there are three federally recognized Patuan tribes, Kechil Dihi Band of Winton Indians of the Calusa Indian community, Kletzel Dihi Winton Nation, and Yocha Dihi Winton Nation. The Patuan people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. I'd like to welcome everybody who's attending today and I'd most especially like to thank our panelists for making time to talk with us today. Before we get around to introducing them, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge USDA's Western Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, otherwise known as Western SARE, which has provided the funding for this six part webinar series on racial equity in extension. I also want to thank Julia Kalika of our a &R Program Support Unit, who is providing our technical support today. And I'm very grateful for all the work put in by my Sarah colleague, Gwenelle Engelskirchen, who really has masterminded this webinar today and has brought our panelists to us. And she'll be moderating as well. <clears throat> Today, we're gonna to be talking about the critical topic of land justice, who owns and who gets to use farmland. This is going to be the first of two parts. So today we'll focus a little more on the history of land access for people of color in California and in the US. And then in the next webinar, which will be taking place on Thursday, December 9th, so mark your calendars, We'll be focusing a little more on alternative models that are already operating out there to actually get people of color more access to farmland and to help mitigate some of these historical, historical and current day injustices. And I also want to take this opportunity to say that those of us organizing this webinar are mostly all white. And so we do want to acknowledge that it's possible that we are approaching the topic with certain blind spots in our perspectives. And we certainly hope and welcome the panelists um, to bring these to light or correct us if needed. So as somebody who works with UC Serap and also with Western SARE, I have to ask the question, what does the topic of land ownership and land access have to do with sustainable agriculture? So besides the obvious that land is the foundation of agriculture, there's also, um, we need to keep in mind that sustainable farming practices in particular often require long-term commitments in things like, for example, irrigation infrastructure improvements and soil health and other things that can take years to develop and see the benefits from. So if we as extension professionals want to work with farmers on adopting sustainable practices, at the very least, we need to understand the unique historically determined constraints to long-term land tenure on any or any land tenure at all faced by different groups amongst our clientele. Not to mention, of course, there's a really important economic justice aspect of land ownership and its ability to help build wealth across generations. And Gwenelle, do you want to give some technical inputs? Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Gwenelle. And before we get started, I just wanna cover a few tech details for the webinar. So you won't be able to use your microphone um, if you have questions for any of the presenters, or if you have any technical problems, please use the Q&A, which is located in the Zoom navigation bar. Um, you may use the chat feature also to share any links or resources um, that you wish to share with the other participants, and, and we may drop links in there as well. Live automated captions are being provided for this webinar. Um, if you don't see these, if you don't wish to see these, you can switch them off 
by clicking on the CC Live captions in the Zoom navigation bar and selecting Hide Captions. We are recording the webinar, so you'll be able to go back and listen to any part of it if you wish to do so. And the recording will be made available on the UC a &R YouTube channel. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we'll be adding a link to the chat for a feedback survey. And we'd love to hear how this webinar went and how it could be improved. Thank you, Gwinnell. Um... Yes, and I see people have been introducing themselves. If you haven't done so yet, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name, pronouns, and the tribal land that you are on. And you can um, learn about the tribal land you're on by going to the native land link um, that we have in the chat where you can enter your location. It's really relevant today since we are talking about land and access to land. Um, it helps to understand who has been stewarding our lands since long before our colonial era here in California. Um, okay, so we're gonna start this webinar with a quick poll question just to get an idea of who is participating today. So the question here, I hope you can all see it. It's what is your job? and just select your, the category closest to what you do and we'll see what the results are in just a minute. All right, here we go. Okay, so we do have cooperative extension folks as the largest category, welcome. And we also have a good number of nonprofit or community-based organizations and NRCS um, farmers, nice, and some researchers. Good, so a lot of really extension focused people out there, sounds like. All right, thank you, Julia. Um, so, all right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, thank you, go now. Great, um, so we feel really fortunate today to be joined by four accomplished and insightful speakers, researchers, educators, storytellers, and a farmer. Um, each with a different lens on the topic of land access and relationship to land. And we'll be hearing presentations from these panelists in succession. Um, and at the end, we'll have time for Q&A and discussion. Um, but I'd like to first invite each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. So we're gonna have the panelists unmute and you'll get to hear just a bit about who is joining us on the webinar today. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Nikiko Masumoto. I'm Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese American. And my home is on unceded Yokut people land. And our farm is fed by the waters, more specifically of the Tachi people. I'm looking forward to discussion and learning and listening. Hey y'all, I am Caroline Collins. I am joining you from Chula Vista on unceded Kumeyaay lands. I have a real love for storytelling and for research. And so the way that I've been fortunate to work on both of those aspects of my joys, I am a postdoctoral fellow at UC San Diego, and then also the CalAG Roots producer at the California Institute for Rural Studies. And I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. Hey, I'm Kumalia Satindakwan, Didiktawante Ohea Brittany Arona. I am an enrolled member of the Hupa Valley Tribe and a PhD candidate in Native American Studies and Human Rights at UC Davis. Um, my work mainly focuses on the history of California water rights, uh, water diversions, uh, issues surrounding water in the state of California, and how um, industry has been a part of that. Um, for Native peoples. I specifically focus on Hupa, Yurok, and Karuk peoples in Northwestern California and the Klamath River Basin, and also do a lot of work on federal Indian law and uh, California Indian law as well. So it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And hi, everybody. I'm the fourth panelist. Uh, my name is Megan Horst, and I'm an associate professor at Portland State University. Uh, so I live and work in Portland, Oregon, land of the Kalapuya people. And also, you know, recently kind of well known in the media for uprisings about racial injustice and police brutality. 
And thinking a lot about that today, for those who've been following the news, the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse is hitting me hard as a, I was born in Wisconsin. I'm thinking a lot today about how today is a really salient, every day, but today is especially salient to talk about um, equity, racial justice, and other across all issues. So I'm thinking a lot about that as we transition to our talks. Um, I'm a trained urban planner and I teach in urban studies and planning. Uh, and I work a lot on land use, food systems, and climate action work. Uh, and urban planners, we often talk about farmland preservation, but my work is also trying to talk about who has access to farmland, who's managing it, how, uh, and kind of the connections among social racial equity to the concept of farmland preservation. So trying to bridge that gap. Um, and today I'm going to share a, a little bit of highlights from a recent paper that I published that I think will, uh, so it's kind of an academic talk and I'll just be sharing 10 minutes of highlights. And I'm gonna start my timer for myself now. There we go and share screen. So I'm just gonna share a few highlights from a paper I worked on with a fellow, with a graduate student uh, a few years ago and the paper is titled Racial, Ethnic and Gender Inequities in Farmland Ownership and Farming in the US. And like I was saying earlier, I think the paper will set up kind of the the future panelists to talk a little bit about things from their own perspectives. Uh, the paper, really a traditional academic paper, so I'm going to talk about it that way. The, the, objective, the objective in it was to investigate causes and the extent of disparities among farmland owners, farm operators, and farm workers by race, ethnicity, and gender. And I want to say that kind of one of my goals with uh, in this paper was to look at uh, who, like, questions among farmers by breaking down who is a farmer, because sometimes a lot of that gets conflated in national data around farmers. Uh, and I wanted to look at farmland owners, farm operators and farm workers kind of together and separately and understand how they uh, like understand the differences among their access to land by race, ethnicity and gender. Uh, and perhaps a very unsurprising finding really from the paper is that there are significant, really significant racial, ethnic, and gender disparities that persist in agriculture. And in fact, are no worse, no better, and maybe even worse than they were 100 years ago uh, when it comes to representation, land, and money. So the paper unpacks like a brief history of farmland ownership and farming in the US. And I talk a lot about the three things in this very simple Venn diagram here. Uh, and I unpack a little bit of the history in the last 400 years or so in the US that is built on systems of private land ownership and westernized notions of agriculture, racial and gendered capitalism, and policy support at federal, state, and other levels for and a push for consolidation and industrialization in agriculture. Uh, so all three of these things are intertwined, but today I'll talk mainly about, or I'm only gonna focus mainly on the racial and gendered capitalism aspect of it. So when I talk about racial and gendered capitalism, I'm really drawing from other scholars. I mentioned here Gilmore and Robinson, for example, lots of other folks have kind of shown me a lot, taught me a lot about these concepts. Uh, and I sort of layer together racial and gendered capitalism in the paper. Uh, and I'm trying to understand how racism and capitalism are, are deeply connected in US agriculture. And other scholars kind of describe racial capitalism as a global phenomenon hinged on long connected histories of dispossession and labor across diverse geographies and time periods. Basically, capitalism and racism exist with each other uh, and it can't really be separated. And also I recognize that it's entangled not only with race, capitalism is entangled not only with race, but also other systems of oppression and the one I focus mainly on in the paper in addition to race is gender. Uh, so we could spend hours talking about some about this, but you know, a few examples that may be familiar to folks in this call today and that we may hear about from other speakers are on this slide. And I talk about them in the paper uh, as they impact different groups. And I don't intend that this is an oversimplified look, of course, uh, but it at least shows some highlights and the long list and small font necessary on this slide sort of exemplifies just how many examples there are of racial and genderized, gendered capitalism in US agriculture. And the image on the right uh, relates to comments we've all been making and talking about whose land we're calling in from, but that um, you know, all of agriculture in the US is practiced on land that was stolen from Native Americans or that Native Americans were shoved off of, dispossessed, uh, et cetera. So you know, the, the map here shows land loss, which is just one example of racialized capitalism in the US. And, 
in my paper, I talk about all kinds of other examples that interweave and create the system we're operating in today. And I want to point out too, towards the bottom, one point I make about gender is that it's intersectional with race and ethnicity. So there are lots of ways that women of all race and ethnicities were have been kept back from accessing farmland as owners and operators, um, but certainly women who's who identify who, who are Black, Native American, Asian American have had kind of intersecting barriers with those other identities as well. So the paper, you know, the 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 data part of it is that I looked at, well, what are the disparities today? And that actually wasn't a really, it unfortunately is a harder question to answer than, than I would hope as a researcher. And in part because the data exists in lots of different places and it's not, there's gaps and problems with all the data that I could talk about for a long time. Um, and just basically the USDA is not very forthcoming with, like, with great data on race and ethnicity across these different types of farmers. So that's an area for future pushed by activists and researchers, but I did look, attempt to look at um, three sources of data, again, trying to understand landowners, farm operators, uh, primary operators, I should say, and then farm workers. And these are the, the data sources I drew on and they all have kind of their own limitations. And the findings, as I already mentioned earlier, not surprising, but important, are that there are significant demographic disparities the vast, vast, vast majority of owners and operators are white, non-Hispanic, and male. Uh, racial and ethnic disparities are worse among landowners, kind of an important concept because of the three groups, landowners are the most perhaps powerful of the three groups, or are the most powerful, I shouldn't say perhaps. Disparities are worse by acreage and income, and I'll say more about that in the last slide. And the disparities that I know are probably worse because of how data is collected, maybe it's probably showing increases, recent increases, for example, in black farmers, that are more about how the data is collected than actual increases. And there's been other folks who've talked about this in media. But kind of a, a little bit more detailed findings are that white Americans are most likely to own land and benefit from the wealth it generates. And white people comprise over 97% of non-farming non landowners, 96% of owner operators, and 86% of tenant operators across the country. And then they generated 98% of farm related income and 97% of the income that comes from operating farms. So their kind of majority dominance is even higher in the income generation. And then meanwhile, people of color farmers are much more likely to be tenants, own smaller parcels of land and generate less farm related income. And particularly Latino, Latinx, Hispanic farmers are disproportionately farm laborers. And then there are also disparities by gender noted, noted here too. So the paper goes on to sort of show lots of charts and data tables uh, for those who kind of learn that way or want to dig into that kind of stuff. You can dig into the paper, but these bar charts are meant to sort of give a, a snapshot, a visual of the, the data points I just said. So again, noting kind of the dominance of, of white landowners uh, and owner operators and then um, tenants. And you can also see that breakdown by male and female. Uh, this is a similar chart, but just showing again that white farmers not only make up the most number of landowners and farmers, but they own more land. And actually more land than they would suggest by their percentage in the, in the uh, category of landowners and farm operators. And then here's farm related income. So white farmers generate 98% of farm related income in the United States. So um, for, I, I should have added a slide here, but like, why does all this matter? Uh, what does all this mean? Um, well, I think I said earlier, one thing that I have taken away from this research is that agriculture remains a highly, highly, highly racially segregated industry in the United States, highly segregated. And in fact, maybe even worse than than a hundred years ago when black farmers had actually significantly high percentage of, uh, were, were significantly higher in percentage of being both landowners and farmer tenants. Um, so in, one implication is that for those of us working in food and farmland, sustainability and justice related endeavors, we have a long way to go. And I wanted to do some thinking, uh, what can we do about all this? Um, the, Here's some ideas that I've had about like, why does it matter? What can we do? What do we do to change some of these numbers? 
here's just the starting point. I think my future panelists will, will add to it and maybe our discussion will. But, you know, I work a lot with current farmers and farmland owners. And so I think they, there are things they can do. Um, they can engage perhaps in person to person reparations, meaning thinking about who they're transitioning their farmland to. That's not an easy conversation to have with folks. And I haven't, uh, I can talk more about my experience in attempting to have it, uh, but, but it's one thing. White led and white dominated food, food organizations of which I am I'm a part of, uh, from food policy councils to incubator farms can, can do a lot to think about how their own practices perpetuate racial privilege and can figure out how to amplify and act in solidarity with efforts around racial justice and in changing their organizations to better serve the goals of racial equity in farmland. Agricultural institutions, including universities, land grant universities, can confront their racist legacies. There's a lot to say about that one and build thoughtful and long-term relationships with community partners. Whoops, that's my timer for myself. Grant makers can apply a racial equity lens um, and that's something I'm working on locally in Portland. We have a new fund called the Portland Clean Energy Fund uh, that's giving away $9 million a year to uh, all kinds of sustainability work here in the city of Portland and including to regenerative agriculture is considered one of the buckets of work. And we do apply a, a lens that where the grant funding is supposed to be benefiting uh, organizations led by people of color and or benefiting directly. So that's kind of an example. Um, and public agencies and land managers, such as parks departments, can permanently protect land for food cultivation and make land accessible for reclaiming native foodways. Activists and organizers can call for racial justice in the Farm Bill, which um, and call on federal government. Don't necessarily have a lot of hope about major change at the federal government level, but it's necessary to keep calling for it, I think. And then as a researcher, I think one of my roles is to keep calling for better data and transparency from the USDA and from other reporting sources uh, and keep reporting on these uh, inequities so that we can have better, better data and just better transparency uh, about, our, about our demands. So I'm at time now and I see a few comments in the chat box I'll try to respond to while other folks continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. That was a tremendous amount of information in a short amount of time. And um, I really, really appreciate that sort of um, context ground, ground laying. Um, so we're gonna transition to our next panelist. I also, earlier this week, I attended a webinar that was called How to Rematriate the Land. It was hosted by the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And the moderator incorporated a practice that I really appreciated, which was to invite everyone to take a breath in between the presenters. So I'd like to adopt that here and I invite you to just take a moment and take a breath. And I'm going to pass it over to Brittany. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. What a great um, starting presentation, a lot of great and interesting data and I'm looking forward to reading uh, your paper, Megan. Um, so I already introduced myself and um, my work, and most of my work is really focused on California. I am a California Native person and have been uh, deeply affected by uh, ongoing land dispossession and the history of that dispossession in the state of California. And so when I was thinking about how to really frame this, I decided to focus on the very early years of state formation. It's a history that when I talk about it, people don't quite know about it. Um, they're often very, very shocked that this could occur in the state of California, which is often described as a liberal uh, state in the contemporary period. Um, but I really do like to talk about how um, the state of California and the formation of California um, led to indigenous land dispossession and was deeply tied to the genocide of my people and peoples across the state. So. I'm gonna hide myself so I don't see myself talking. Um, so this is a map of uh, the both the UC system and uh, California tribal groups. So on the left-hand side, we see a map of California tribal groups. We are the most diverse um, groups of tribes in the United States. Um, there's many different languages, cultures that are very different from each other um, and tribal formations and relationships that we've had with each other since time immemorial. 
um, and that's really important. And our connection to land runs deep. Um, we are still very connected to our lands. Sometimes I get questions from people. It's like, well, what about Los Angeles? It's like, well, people in uh, tribes in Los Angeles still exist and uh, exist in those urban centers and still very much see themselves as part of that land, even as it's urbanized. Um, so my tribe is in Northwestern California. I'm from the Hoopa Valley tribe. And then our neighboring tribes are the Yurok Karuk on the Klamath River Basin. And on the right-hand side is a picture of the different lands that the UC uh, has relationships with, um, owns all of that. So I like to kind of put those two in to show um, how the UC system intersects with um, native lands today. So I'm going to just jump right in to the colonization period. Um, so when the Spanish came to the United, uh, sorry, when the Spanish came to California, they commented in their diaries on how beautiful uh, California was, how it was like a garden of Eden, a beautiful place. But really, it was because Native people uh, tended that land since time immemorial. Our relationship to the land includes gathering practices, basketry. Um, relationships with fisheries and um, deer and I, sorry, animals uh, are more than human relatives. Uh, and I like to say that I like to bring that up because it really matters in um, modern native perspectives of land as well. We maintain those relationships and have continued to maintain those relationships despite colonial violence. So um, the Spanish are the first uh, colonial power that comes into California in 1769 with the establishment of uh, the Mission San Diego in uh, Southern California. And the missions really uh, wreak havoc on the California Indian um, population and relationship with the land. So there's violence, uh, slave labor, sexual violence, and land dispossession. Um, so the mission system really uses that to, to control California Indian people on the coast and in the inland. Um, in 1821, uh, the mission system mission system is taken over by the Me by the Mexican government, and land grants are given to settlers for the interior of California. So while this period between the Spanish and Mexican um, government control is uh, very devastating for Native peoples. It is nothing compared, well, it's a lot, but it is the American colonization period is especially devastating for um, Native people in California. So we're in the American period right now, and as Alyosha Goldstein, um, an American studies scholar, describes it, the colonial present in the American period today. Um, most historians point to it starting in 1846 into the present day. So the United States ceases control of California from Mexico in 1846. And then in 1848, uh, gold is discovered in California and it begins the California Gold Rush. So the California Gold Rush is a foundational event in California Indian history because it brings an influx of settlers into the state. While the Spanish and Mexican period are often defined as more labor-based. So um, the Mexican and Spanish col colonists use Native American labor um, rather than outright kill Native peoples. America, the American period marks the beginning of um, state-sanctioned genocide. So in 1850, at the formation of the state of California, the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians is passed from the first legislature by um, the legislative body and signed into law by Governor Peter Burnett. So Peter Burnett calls for the extermination of Native people across um, California and the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians is, uh, despite its name, is a act of genocide and it basically calls for the uh, indenture of Native people to be made useful on land and also establishes uh, Native American vagrancy laws um, that are very stringent. So at this time, militias, volunteer militias in California are going out to different village sites across the state and massacring Native people, um, men, women, and children. So all of, the tri all of our tribes in California have these stories. My tribe has these stories. Um, and so Kutcher was involved 
Dr. Ketcher Rizabaldi from Humboldt State University often talks about this in her talks and mentions that her great grandfather told her mother that you're only here because a minor was a bad shot. That's how kind of violent this things were things were happening at the formation of the state. So in 1851, the California state legislator develop, develops water man, the beginnings of water management plans. And this is really important because um, at the early start of California, gold mining is the most important industry, but that only lasts uh, for a period of about maybe 10 or 20 years. And then agriculture and timber really take over as the predominant industry in um, the state. So water management is a major part of the agricultural project because of the massive levels of diversions that occur um, at the formation of the well, yeah, uh, start occurring in the early 20th century. And the development of these uh, this industry really begins at the formation of the state. So between generally um, historians tend to point out that um, the military campaigns uh, by both California and American militias um, starts in 1846 and ends in 1873. So these campaigns are specifically designed uh, to remove native peoples off their lands um, through eradication. That's why it's called the state sanction genocide. Um, so there are 18 unratified treaties uh, that are negotiated at the height of um, American and Indi California Indian genocide in the state between 1851 and 1852. Um, so these unratified treaties, I'm not sure if you could see on the screen, um, but they're blocked off by green, purple, yellow, orange. Um, and it, Garrett, these treaties are negotiated by uh, three commi federal commissioners. And at this time, as I was talking about before, there's still militia campaigns that are going out um, from the state of California. So the governor is still pushing for um, volunteer militias to go out and um, kill native peoples at the time that these treaties are, are formulated. So the 18 unratified treaties uh, guarantee 7.5 million acres of land to native peoples. As the name suggests, they are not ratified and they're actually um, by the Senate and they're actually hidden away until they're rediscovered in 1920. Um, so because they're not ratified, 7.5 million acres are not um, given to Native peoples. And the reason that they're not unratif they're unratified is because of a push from different industry, both gold and agriculture, for the government to not ratify these treaties because they did not want to give up the land to Native peoples in the state. Um, so after this period ends, Native people become, in California, become homeless, quote unquote, and there are only five uh, reservations that are established in California. So my tribe has the largest reservation in California, which is 12 miles by 12 miles, which is 144 square miles. It's a pretty small uh, tract of land, but other tribes um, have even less than that. So the reason I point all of this out is because often when we're talking about uh, the genocide of Native peoples in the state, we're not also talking about the land dispossession that occurred because of that genocide um, and because of the relationship that both the gold mining industry and agriculture has to this genocide. So the reason that this occurs is to protect settler property, um, to protect settler industry claims, um, and protect um, settler rights on these lands. So again, the reason that this genocide occurs is to remove people, Indian people off of the land. So early environmental laws in the state uplift industry, gold mining, and agriculture. Um, so through the development of water infrastructure, gold mining, and agriculture, so early California law protects these things. And now in the state of California, water rights can trace their origin back to the um, gold mining era. 
So first in time, first in right comes um, from this time period. Opposition to the ATA and ratified treaties was directly related to indigenous land dispossession. Again, 7.5 million acres that were uh, negotiated and then not ratified. And then native people become um, homeless on their own lands. So I thought I had a little bit more, um, but something that I do want to say, um, I'm obviously looking and telling you about um, a period in history in the 1850s that people tend to think is a long time ago, but it really isn't because this still affects um, California Indian people into the present, despite the government's attempts um, to kill us off, um, to commit genocide against us, we have remained and we endure on our homelands and have never forgotten our homelands. So I think that's a really important um, to point out. There's still, as much as the government tried to eradicate us for the indus industrial purposes, Native people fought back. Um, Native people fought back against these military campaigns, uh, fought get back against this uh, land dispossession, and continue to fight into the present day. Um, there's a period, there's a lot more history, obviously, to cover in California. I'm thinking about the Indian Lands Claims Commissions, um, the different advocacy fights around water and uh, land. But I do just want to point out that Native people uh, continue to advocate for themselves. Um, I sit on the board of Save California Salmon, where we work with many tribes across the state on water rights and also understanding that relationship to agriculture as well. Um, so I think it's really important to think about how the state of California, how the United States is formed. Um, and it's really formed at the basis of capitalism. Um, it's really formed in the state of California for industry. Um, and that has continued up into the present. So the governor of California has apologized uh, for the genocide that occurred between 1846 and 1873. But I think one of the questions that Native people are asking in California today, is like, well, apology is great, but what are you going to get back in return? Are we going to get our lands back? And so there's been a big push in um, California Indian circles related to land back um, to both return our lands and to also um, help remediate some of these ongoing issues related to both gold mining, agriculture, and timber that um, still are inflicted upon our homelands. And so I'm, I, I think that that's about it on my end. Um, I really appreciate being here and I look forward to uh, further discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany, for that really important context and also questions um, in terms of how we think about land in California. Um, I'd like to invite everyone again to take a breath. And next we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Caroline Collins. Thank you and thank you to Megan and Brittany for um, such wonderful context. This brief, oh, speaking of 15 minutes, let me start my timer. Um, this brief talk um, is going to be talking about African-American histories in rural California. I have to click it that way. Um, my talk is mainly gonna focus on early homesteading and black settlements in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, but I, I do want us to keep in mind um, the ongoing connections between how these histories are told and untold and how we continue to think about folks' relationships to the land, especially since I'm a communication scholar and not a historian. Uh, I'm gonna walk through this by doing a, a brief um, overview of some context and then highlighting some individuals and some of the settlements that they formed in uh, rural California. So um, when the story of Black people in California gets told, it's usually through this framework of the Great Migration, um, uh, about when um, 
between 1915 and 1960 when 5 million Black Americans left the South. And while the Great Migration is certainly a really important part of state history, it doesn't fully represent the origins of Black people in California. Um, in fact, Black people have been in California since the onset of Spanish colonization in the 16th century. African sailors and interpreters, both enslaved and free, uh, first arrived with conquistadors. And by the 18th century, free Black settlers um, were part of the original settlers or pobladores who established cities across California. For instance, uh, in 1781, half of the pobladores that founded the present day city of Los Angeles were of African descent and some were of full black ancestry. And by 1790, uh, one in five California residents was Afro-Latino according to the National Park Service. Um, and the offspring of these settlers would come to be known as Californios, uh, most of whom were of mixed indigenous and African descent like Pio Pico um, who was the last governor of California, of Alta California. And these Californios also overwhelmingly occupied a huge land grant ranchos that were sustained by uh, Indian labor across Mexican California. And so this history is important to highlight um, because it um, shows us a really critical shift uh, that Brittany was speaking about earlier um, that occurred with the onset of Anglo-American rule in California when um, understandings of race went from something that were not um, as decisive of a factor in determining opportunities or, or legal status um, to becoming this new framework that were built on notions of racial inferiority um, that justified Native genocide and discrimination against um, Mexicans, um, Asians, Blacks, and other groups. So um, despite this great migration narrative, um, we need to keep in mind that people of African descent have actually been in colonial California uh, before Anglo settlers were here in any significant number. And while many Black folks came to city centers and still reside in urban areas, African Americans are not strangers to rural California. And for generations, they've shaped life in uh, the state's agricultural areas. So whether it's the history of occupation and theft of native lands, or the history of cultivation of lands, Black people are often uh, excluded from these really iconic stories that um, help us understand California history in particular ways. And I have a personal and professional um, connection to all of this this these stories my family has roots in the american west so my um, research looks at how the history of the american west gets made and remade and i do that through a lot of um, public exhibition and and uh, films and podcasts and so the majority of this talk is actually rooted in a podcast that i um, just recently did with different community partners called we're not strangers here african americans um, histories in rural california and so the project was really heavily centered on archival work, uh, because even if traditional histories don't point to African Americans being in early California, we know that those representations really just don't align with actual documentation of the time. Or as our primary history uh, advisor summed it up, if you go back and you read newspapers or you read court documents or other primary source materials from those times, you'll find Black people in the record because they lived in rural California. So I dug into the archives looking for materials, many of which you're going to see in this brief talk. And then we also made it a point to really expand our understanding of what we considered archives and not just trying to rely on traditionally held material and institutions also speaking to descendants of Black homesteaders and gathering oral histories, etc. And this um, archival study led us to uncovering stories about individual settlers um, who have been part and parcel of, of rural California working the land um, in US California since the gold rush era. So that led us to individuals like Alvin Coffey, um, who um, came from Missouri um, during the gold rush, like many other um, Black uh, settlers did. However, he came enslaved. Um, although California was a quote unquote free state, slavery was pretty much practiced out in the open. So during the gold rush, many Black white, I mean, many white Southerners came with enslaved labor, including folks like Alvin Coffey. Um, and when his uh, enslaver um, reneged on their bargain to free him after he toiled in the fields, Coffey came out three times to 
making the overland trip from Missouri to California in order to um, free himself and his wife and children. They eventually um, settled in Red Bluff in Tehama County and had a, a turkey farm and were really involved in their, um, their community. He's also one of the only Black 49ers to leave behind a written account of his pursuits. Um, so other notable um, homesteaders were Gabriel and Mary Moore. Gabriel came out um, from Alabama in 1853, again with enslavers. Um, we're not sure how he uh, earned his freedom, but he eventually did. And he and his wife, Mary, established a 350-acre ranch along the Kings River in Centerville. Um, they're created as, uh, they're, they're accredited as being the, the first um, farmers to plant apple and fig orchards. Um, they're also considered the first African-American ranchers in the state. And then in the area where water is so critical, um, one of their lasting legacies is that they were uh, considered uh, the first people to um, divert the river by building a rock dam, which again goes to the, the really complex history of California where black settlers um, were also part of incipient activity that's had long lasting effects on native clam claims to, to land and to waterways. Um, but black homesteaders also face particular challenges, especially in terms of things like education. Um, they often had to run their own schools. Alvin Coffey helped to, to start one. Another couple, Lucy and Wiley Hines, um, they also did as well. Wiley Hines was a, a farmer who did not come through the gold fields. He came out to the San Joaquin Valley in 1858 specifically to participate in agriculture. Um, and he labored first on other folks' farms before buying his first 80 acres in uh, Farmersville and near Visalia. He eventually kept adding on it until he had over a thousand acres uh, where he raised cattle and hogs. And then he and his wife, Lucy, eventually opened up a uh, what came to be known as the colored school for black Mexican and native children. Um, and this school eventually became embroiled in a landmark California Supreme Court case um, through another black farmer named Edmund Edgar Weisinger. So Edmund, again, another black farmer, he um, came to uh, California uh, during the gold rush and his father was Cherokee and his mother was African-American. Um, he uh, eventually was able to, by mining and Negro bar and other areas, raise $1,000, which today would be over $35,000 to free himself. And then he uh, settled uh, in, uh, in Farmersville and when he uh, tried in 1888 to take his then 12 year old son Arthur to the local school in Visalia, the only public school to be um, educated, he was turned away by a Mr. Crookshank who told him no, go to the, the colored school that the Hines had originally started. Uh, instead, Weisinger took him to court. The court originally sided with Crookshank and the district, but Weisinger took the, court, the case to the California Supreme Court. And then in 1890, uh, 60 years before Brown versus Board of Education, um, um, it was then ruled that um, it, that California schools could not ban black students. Um, and this uh, systemic inequity is, is often what drove some settlers to even seek out rural settlement in the first place. For instance, John Ballard, he originally came out um, to Los Angeles around 1848. Um, he then uh, married a, a woman named Amanda in 1859 who was free. And they lived in Los Angeles, unlike some uh, rural settlers who only were in rural areas. They lived in LA for about two decades. Um, but eventually in 1888, um, he moved to um, to the, the mountains above Malibu. And one of the reasons might be uh, because of har the hardening of, of Jim Crow that was taking place in Los Angeles and other Southern California areas in the 1880s when, with this big sudden influx of, of more um, Anglo-Americans to the Southern portion of the state. And so he had a 160 acre homestead. So did his daughter, um, Alice, when she reached adulthood, uh, they integrated the school there. But even with all of that activity, they still face off sites of harassment their homestead was burned down by arsonists, um, and the hill where they carved out a life was given this egregious slur that was actually part of the formal naming on maps, which was part of racist practices of the time. Um, and it stayed that way until 2010 when the, the mountain was formally changed um, to uh, Ballard Mountain in, in 2010. And so um, often to um, 
kind of work against some of the, the systemic inequity, many um, African American settlers um, worked together to form communities where they could count on one another. So um, starting as early as the 19th century, Black communities, large and small, loosely organized and formal, they all took shape across California. Um, and they developed for a mixture of reasons from proximity to employment, to settler preference, to exclusionary practices that banned or discouraged Black people from settling in other areas, uh, but nearly all of them were in rural California, um, from the woodlands near the Oregon border to the mountains of rural San Diego, and especially in Central Valley um, because of a lot of the farming communities. And often Allensworth is the one that's most well known, but there were all of these various types of settler settlements. So for instance, some were these small enclaves where a cluster of black pioneers just settled in the same general area, like Julian, California, which is a, a mountain town, town in San Diego County. Um, it it uh, had quite a few of Black Indigenous uh, settlers until its big um, gold rush of 1870, which was actually started by a Black man named uh, Fred Coleman. And he had participated in the Northern California gold rush. So uh, he knew to capitalize by building a toll road. He started a mining district and all kinds of folks started to come, including um, Albert uh, uh, Robertson um, and uh, Margaret Robinson, who uh, eventually opened the Hotel Robinson in uh, Julian. It's still open today under a different name, but it is the longest continuously run hotel in California. Um, other folks like America Newton came, who uh, bought an 80 acre um, uh, homestead in, in Julian, and she um, was had a really uh, enterprising laundry business. Um, there were other Black communities like Fowler. I mentioned the Weisingers earlier earlier um, after that successful California Supreme Court case four generations of Weisinger's continued to grow peaches and grapes in, in uh, Fowler. Um, and there were all types of civic and cultural institutions that were created in a lot of these communities like churches and baseball teams and um, different types of leagues. Um, but then also as agriculture began to shift from folks coming out to homestead their own land, we also started to see a community shift as well, especially uh, beginning as, as early as the 1888, um, you started to see these large scale agriculture uh, growers recruit Southern black workers to come out and harvest fruits and vegetables and cotton in the central and imperial valleys. This also took place in uh, rural adjacent fields like lumber. Um, and so then you start to see the birth of communities that were organized around the recruitment of black labor. Um, so you have places even like weed up near the Oregon border where this town grew in the 1920s all sprung up around the the um the lumber industry um and um and uh, it was a uh, very highly segregated um also agricultural migration then continued to california through throughout the, the early 20th century and then during the great migration you start to see another type of of um migrant you start to see black okies um white okies are very much part of popular culture through things like the grapes of wrath but up to 50,000 black okies also made that iconic migration from states like texas and in kansas and oklahoma um, a lot a lot of them settled in places like Teveston uh, in the Central Valley, where they worked in cotton fields, uh, in grape fields, and almond fields, etc. Uh, you start to see less home ownership during this period, more renting, a lot of predatory and exclusionary practices uh, based on race during this period as well. And so these communities, they didn't just then develop out of settler preference. Uh, they also grew, as I mentioned, out of these uh, exclusionary practices like redlining that continued well into the 20th century until the passing of the 19th. 1968 Fair Housing Act. And so these types of Black settlements weren't intended to be self-sufficient. They relied on existing services in nearby towns, and they were subject to the whims and the violence often of, of their white neighbors. Um, and then finally, you had uh, these formal towns um, that were part of a nationwide Black town movement that began after the Civil War in the South, and then also in places like Kansas and California. And these towns were rooted in principles that linked land ownership to Black independence. So in, in 1908, a group of settlers um, led by the town's namesake, Colonel Allen Allensworth, founded Allensworth, a Black town in Tulare County. 
and this is my last slide. Um, and so um, it's 40 miles north of Bakersfield. They planted farms, they started businesses. Um, they had churches, a church, a general store, schoolhouse, a blacksmith barber shop. Uh, it was a thriving town. They had a, a glee club and um, music orchestra. Um, also the first uh, branch of the Tulare County Library, but it was also subject to all kinds of racist practices. Um, their second, uh, um, um, enterprise where the a white company would not service their wells. They also had a depot session station and white farmers complain about having to do business with them. So the Santa Fe Railroad actually built a spur line to bypass them. And so they lost a lot of business with that. Um, and then over time, they also just lost residents to migration to urban areas following other national trends. And today their legacy lives on through a um, state historic park. Um, but had it not been for such entrenched racist practices and of a state park, the, um, the city might still be there and be thriving. And so that was a lot of history, but I'm just hoping that you'll just take away um, that there are all of these really long histories and think about how being aware of this history might help you when you are doing your own programming. So thank you very much. And, and that's it for me. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and I, if folks haven't listened um, or aren't familiar with the podcast that Caroline produced, um, We Are Not Strangers Here, I highly recommend it. Um, so again, before our final panelist, I invite you to take a breath if you wish. And with that, I will hand it over to Nikiko. Hey, everyone. I am feeling very moved, um, very unsettled in a great way. Um, some of the histories shared today, some of it I, I know and some of it I don't know. And so I want to offer in my little bit of time a couple different points of departure. I'm going to share a little bit about my family's history as a Japanese American family, but I want to get us um, into a little bit of digestion space together. Um, I'm feeling very full and very grateful. So if you would get something to write with, you can type or write whichever you feel moved to do. I'm gonna ask us to engage in a series of reflections and you can take or leave whatever you would like. Um, I wanna particularly highlight, I'm really interested in translation, how we, bear witness to each other's histories. And I also just wanna note that for um, some of us, some of what is shared today may be triggering. And so to make sure you care for yourself in whatever way you need, and if there's anything we can do for you, please know we wanna center people of color and indigenous people today. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna give us 30 seconds of quiet time to just jot down, what did you hear today? What, did, what have you learned right now? So there'll be a, a chime. So go ahead, write, don't edit, just write. And I know this is very short, so this is just a, just a springboard. So you have about 10 more seconds. All right. Take a breath, pause for a second. Um, now I want to invite you to think in your memory of your lived experience of a time that you maybe made a mistake or did something that hurt someone either intentionally or unintentionally, doesn't matter. Um, and I want you to think about what accountability feels like in your body like when have you been asked to be accountable and how did that feel in your body did you feel it in your shoulders in your throat in your gut what did that feel like so i'm going to give you a similar amount of time to just free write what does accountability feel like in your body All right, and pause, pause there. And our last free write prompt um, is, was totally threaded throughout 
everyone's presentation, Megan, Brittany, Caroline, um, themes and language of repair and of healing. So I'd like you to think about a moment in your life where you've experienced healing, where you've experienced um, releasing forgiveness, repair, whichever of those words resonates with you. And how did that healing moment feel? What was that like? I'll give you another minute. You can pause, pause there. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking a pause with me. Um, I wanted to do that because um, I, I need to digest so much information. And these three themes, what do we learn? What is accountability? And what is healing and repair? Have been threaded through my experience, um, both as a mixed race Japanese American, as a queer person, and as someone who's deeply unsatisfied with the status quo, both in food and farming and generally in our nation. So I wanted to anchor us there in learning, accountability, and repair. And I want to share moments, snapshots of my learning about my own family history as anchors to just share what I, some of the journey that I have been on and threaded through um, my sharing are going to be different, um, different elements of how translation shows up, how repair might look, um, and what solidarity might be like in our journeys of accountability towards each other. So I want to start by just naming the my background photo. Um, that's our Rose Diamond Nectarine Orchard. And um, we're a certified organic farm. My family has been on this land. I'm the fourth generation to get to work the same soil. And for me, that Yonsei identity being a fourth generation is, is really pivotal to how I understand the world. Um, these trees that you can see behind me, um, they were planted in, um, I, I got to plant them with my father um, when I decided to come back to farm when I was 19. Um, but our oldest orchard on our farm was planted by my Jichan, my grandfather, um, and with the help of my dad. And our farm, he started farming in 1948. And for our family, that year is very important. 1948 was just three years after my Japanese American family was finally released from concentration camps. Um, and in my, during which they were imprisoned in during World War II. And in my study and understanding of the interconnectedness between settler colonialism, xenophobia, and racism, um, there have been particularly poignant moments that have uplifted the specificity of how these interlocking systems that we've been hearing about all afternoon um, work to have worked and continue to work to hurt people. Um, and, and one of the most poignant moments for me was I, a few years ago, I got to visit Gila River, which is the site where my family was incarcerated during World War II. And Gila River, um, the concentration camp, was built by the United States government on native territory, sovereign native land of the Gila River Indian community. And of course, as colonialism um, instructs our government, they built our prison camp for my family without asking permission. And we were guided to the site, um, which was a really powerful experience by a member of the Gila River Indian community. And I will never forget, the moment that he said out loud, this was an internment camp built within an internment camp. And that moment was the first time that I had put my, the, the violence of my family's history in context of direct, a direct linkage to our system of displacement of native people. And so I share that because I think it highlights for me both the way in which me as an individual, as a Japanese American, I can hold strong to the histories of survival of my community. And at the same time, I can understand and unpack how my community and my multiple identities have been threaded through simultaneous systems of oppression. 
And what does it mean? How can I be accountable to the Gila River Indi Indian community um, and to the communities of, upon whose land I farm? Um, and so I just wanted to share that small moment. And then I wanted to share an, um, two, two facts, which I think are, are very widely known, but I wanna um, enter the facts um, in a slightly different point of departure. So um, for the Japanese American community, my, my community, there are two historic moments in California history that have completely framed um, our experience of either feeling welcome or unwelcome and our opportunities for life in this country. And that has been um, in California history in 1913 and 1920, alien land laws were passed specifically to bar Asian immigrants from owning land. So for me, that means my great grandparents could not own land just because they were Asian. So if you think about that in terms of generational wealth, as, as the way that most white people have garnered their wealth across um, the history of the United States, that means that my family, an entire generation, was barred from even trying to build a business, to own a farm, to claim a place of belonging. And then, of course, the second um, traumatic event, World War II, um, and I, I want to Going to enter the World War II discussion um, just through one statistic related to agriculture. In 1940, 45% of all Japanese immigrants, so my great grandparents or their children, Japanese Americans, 45% were involved directly with growing food in California. So if you envision your entire family, what that means for me is that half of my ancestors and elders directly had made their livelihood through working with the soil, working with the land. That was in 1940. Then incarceration happened, um, executive order 9066, and all of our families were ripped from our homes. And we lost everything. So that statistic for me is not just a number. It ties me to the depth that I feel when I'm in the orchards that my Jishan planted, because I know that when he planted those orchards, he wasn't just starting a business. He was claiming a place of belonging in a country that had very clearly stated that, that he wasn't welcome. And so much as Brittany shared um, and much as Caroline shared with these stories of not only the important understanding of the systemic oppression of our peoples, but understanding those liberatory lineages. Um, Brittany, you said Native people fought back. Your people fought back and continue to fight back. Caroline, you shared these beautiful examples of people fighting through justice systems that weren't designed for them, through creating their own communities. And much in the same vein, when I grow a peach or a nectarine and I envision feeding people, I envision that as an act of resilience and resistance of growing a place of belonging here. So I'll pause there so we can launch into conversation. And I'm just so very grateful for Caroline and Brittany. Um, thank you so much for sharing and Megan for your research. Thank you. Thank you, Nikiko, for taking us through that embodied exercise and sort of helping to bridge some of the distance that I think Zoom creates as well. Um, so yeah, I think with that, we want to open it up um, and invite um, both cross dialogue amongst the panelists, as well as invite the audience to, um, to ask questions that came up for you during this um, you know, very complex um, range of, of presentations. Um, so we invite you to, um, if, you have, if you have questions for all of the panelists or one of the, that you'd like to direct to one of the panelists, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. 
Um, otherwise, I think I'll start. And if we could switch maybe to the screen share um, with everyone, that would be great. Um, so yeah, so something that I um, will pose to, to all of you is that um, I think as we've heard, each of you intersects with the topic of land access in a different way. Um, Nikiko, you're actually working the land. Um, Brittany, Carolyn, and Megan, you're all researchers and educators. Um, Caroline, you have a focus on communication. And um, you know, based on your experiences, I guess, what um, advice would you give to this extension focused audience in terms of how they could approach this topic, um, broach this topic um, with the constituents in their own regions. Um, and it would be great if we could get everyone, um, sort of all of the panelists showing equally on the screen if that's possible. But I'll let I'll let whoever um, wants to go ahead and jump in on that question. It would be great to hear from from all of you or many of you. I'll briefly go. Um, I think it, I guess my my largest piece of advice would be to try to have a respect and an understanding of of long histories. Um, for instance, if we're talking about mobilizing and elevating sustainable practices, um, to think about all the ways in which sustainable agriculture existed for thousands of years here uh, before the onset of colonialism. Um, and so um, instead of thinking of all of these different ways to try to reinvent something, perhaps seeking advice and counsel from people who have been engaged in those types of practices uh, since time immemorial. Um, likewise, in terms of dealing with Black cultures, um, often we see rhetoric about um, getting folks involved as if this is something new, um, as opposed to rekindling something and rekindling something that had been aggressively dismantled for particular ways. Um, so I think um, recognizing long histories is, is one place to start. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I think one of something for me that's always a little bit frustrating is, you know, I grew up in a native community and we've known these things for a very long time and have talked about these things and for a very long time. And I imagine that's pretty common across other communities as well. And so I, I always get a little not I shouldn't maybe project, but I, I get a little frustrated when people are like, oh, I can't not our state, not not this country. And it's like there's this such long histories of um, injustice, inequity, genocide, violence that have happened across all of our communities, right? And I think that if you're, you know, <laughs> Um, somebody that's new to this, then maybe start doing your research on, because there's plenty of stuff that's written about these histories as well, um, before asking somebody to like tell you all their traumas. And, and I find that that has been something that's happened um, to me in like, because I deal a lot with state institutions. So I do a lot of consulting with state institutions. And as administrations change, it's a new set of people that have never heard that. And so I'm just repeating these things all the time. And at some point, it's just like, there are plenty of books out there that you could read and then come into that conversation. And also listening, I think, you know, for Native people, we don't tell people everything about our culture and ourselves. There are things that I don't know about my culture and myself. Um, and so I think also not expecting people to just like share everything to you. Um, that being said, though, of course, people are generous <laughs> and, and kind. And I think it's important. But I think that if you're coming into these communities to really be mindful of that, 
um, that talking about our traumas isn't easy. I'm actually writing my dissertation chapter right now on genocide and land dispossession. So this is coming at a very timely period for me, but it's a really hard history that still affects me and my people and other peoples today. Um, and it's very emotionally fraught, I think. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up that there, there are like, History is never in the past, right? It's very much at the forefront of who we are um, today. I just completely lift up what Brittany and Caroline have just shared. Um, yes, and I, I will kind of lean in, Brittany, to some of what you're describing as the, the experience of when people um, are like shocked or like alarmed that they're just learning so you know about something horrific, um, and so I have both experienced that as uh, the recipient of people being shocked uh, of my family trauma, and I have also experienced it as someone not knowing about someone else's history. And so, speaking from the the moment when I ha am learning about someone else's another community's history, um, to remember to to not center your experience but to in fact like lean in the fact that some of us don't know each other's histories of oppression and violence is exactly a product of privilege so to lean into that and not make it especially bipoc folks black indigenous people of color it's not our responsibility to walk you through your journey of awakening and consciousness um it's your responsibility so like connecting it to what Caroline invited us to think about long histories in our question, like our points of departure, thinking about sustainable agriculture, not as a new thing, <laughs> but as something we need to return to. Um, we can also, this is the flip side of that coin is thinking in the future. How do we seed within ourselves practices of showing up for this work for our entire lives, for showing up, for bearing witness, for showing up, um, in ways that might make us feel uncomfortable and might be hard. Um, but those of us who's, who carry these histories in our bones and our bodies, we don't have a choice of whether or not to show up, right? Because this is our lives. And so for those of you who do have a choice, how do you deepen your commitment and courage to what you're willing to do for the rest of your life? I'll chime in too, um, kind of to the question was, connecting with your own audience. And I can probably best talk about, in this case, the white professional academic audiences. Uh, and I don't think I have an easy answer. I'm also looking at the questions in the chat box, which seem to sort of relate at least, at least a couple of them. Um, but I guess one example is like, you know, white folks are on a different uh they're all kind of on different places on a spectrum i guess of learning and personal commitment so it just depends on the audience you're talking to some folks are going to be ready to move to action and i think there are exciting examples going on of like some people are asking about reparations or in my case i've been trying to look at as a follow-up to that project look at document identify and engage in practices of like public government-led or nonprofit-led or other one-on-one-led efforts of some sort of land-based justice, reparation, access, the right words might depend on the exact case. But for example, I'm working with our local soil and water conservation district, and they are trying hard to figure out how to like do a new way of doing land access uh, with BIPOC communities as the main kind of recipients. That's the wrong word, sorry, but you know, the um, tarp can't think of the right word here, but trying to think of how to actually not re-perpetrate land conservation that benefits white people over and over. So they're thinking a lot about that and we're going through really careful practice and they, and I'm on a racial equity advisory board that's leading, that's advising the effort and it's a long, slow process, but I think it's exciting because it is a different way of government doing business uh, and maybe is changing in a radical way. Maybe it won't, uh, well, I guess it's still, still unfolding, but kind of that's, and I have found that in those spaces, sort of a 
identifying who the fellow, who, where everybody is on a spectrum in the room is sort of helpful and doing some shared historical analysis like we've done today can be really helpful. Setting clear values and like community practices together can be really helpful because it helps to call people in along the way and to like push each other to go more radical and deeper in our thinking and talking and ideas. So that's one thing. Another audience that I engage with are white landowners. And I think that's, who I have failed a lot in those conversations. So I'm not, I think I mainly have learned how to fail in those. Uh, and one way I've failed is like, uh, not meeting people where they're at and then they react with defensiveness saying like, well, farming is really hard and I've gone broke and I'm not making money on this. And now you're accusing me of racism too. Uh, and I'd say that I didn't really, I, I don't think my approach in those situations was all too, it didn't, didn't really work. Um, so I'd say in those cases though, but there are white landowners who are, who have already done some of their own self journey. And I think, and are engaging in efforts to do something and lift, like learning how they got there. And then if they're willing to sort of be examples for others in their shoes, that, that can be helpful. Um, and I think trying to help white farmers see as like a shared root of their problems, kind of this whole system of racialized capitalism is capitalism actually harms most of us, except for the most powerful in all of it. And even the powerful are harmed by being oppressors, I think. But uh, I guess the idea of mutual liberation, like if, if you can get at it, it can be a hard thing to do in like a 10 minute conversation. But those are some really early thoughts I have to very big, deep questions. Yeah, I think that's great. I really appreciate, you know, just all, everything that you guys offered. Um, and I think sort of trying to combine a few different um, questions and threads here is um, just, you know, the, the racial history of California involves many more people and groups than we have um, covered today. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as is also true of the United States as a whole. Um, I mean, I think all of these, we chose to kind of focus on California, but I think these stories play out across, you know, the, the continent of North America um, in, in different and overlapping ways. Um, and so I think just maybe two things in the time that we have remaining sort of jumping off of Brittany's point about like there's information out there and, and um, those of us, you know, who are white, who who don't share those these stories in kind of the um, the embodied or legacy way, have a responsibility to um, inform ourselves. Um, so I'd like to just take this opportunity on this webinar to to ask um, you all what kind of resources or um, you know follow up. Um, sources that you would recommend for people that would like to deepen their own education around these questions. Um, and then kind of um, including within that, um, you know, if you wanna say anything about what you would hope people leave um, with from this webinar, what you hope people take away from what we've talked about today. Um, so resources and any sort of takeaways that um, that you're hoping that people will will carry with them as we close out. Now go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, for for resources, uh, I, I think you know writers like Quintard Taylor and. Delilah Beasley for this is all for for black folks in California, Rudolph Lapp. And I hope what people take with them is this dual understanding of both the long histories that I was talking about too, but also understanding that things like white supremacy, it's fairly recent in human history, and especially here in California. And it's not this thing that's just permanent and done. It takes ongoing work and uh, folks actively work to sustain it every day. And so how are you working to sustain it and or resist? And it happens in really big ways and it happens in really small mundane ways as well. Um, and I think that's just a personal question folks have to wrestle with. 
And I don't think that's the labor of BIPOC folks to walk white people through. So I think that's what I would, would leave people with, as well as a thank you for having me. Thank, yeah, thank you for having me here. And thank you for those points, Caroline, them for really important. Um, for Native history, there's um, more California Indian scholars are coming up, including myself, but others as well. Um, we have an organization called California Indian Scholars and Studies Association that's getting off the ground right now. Um, and so there's a lot of great scholarship there, but I also highly recommend Oh, Brittany, I think you're accidentally muted. Sorry, I got it. <laughs> um, thank you. If you're just learning about California Indian history, there's an excellent book that just came out um, from William Bauer and Damian Atkins, We Are the Land, A History of Native California. Um, it's not necessarily exhaustive, but it gives a good overview of the formation, California Native histories, and then the formation of the state. In your localities, I really recommend you trying to learn more about the Native nations that still exist on that land. Um, we are still, we still exist. Like Native people are still here. There was a big push in the 19th and 20th century to paint us as vanishing, but that is not true at all. Um, we are still here and we maintain presence over our land. Um, and just there's a few questions briefly in the chat. So native people have been working with uh, farmlands, federal and state lands to get lands back. So that's a big movement that's happening right now in California. Um, I'd like to mention that 58% of California is federal land. So we're really pushing on the federal government to give us our lands back. Um, so, but obviously agriculture is also part of that. And so there's been discussions between agricultural groups and native peoples about that and sustainable farming. Um, the UCs absolutely have a responsibility to um, either give those natural reserves back or work with tribes on how to, um, you know, include us in this process that we have been pretty much pushed out of um, since the formation of the UC system from the Morrell Act. And then how do you move past the acknowledgement phase? Speak out. <laughs> I think we're often, you know, BIPOC folks are often the people that are speaking out the most. I'd like to see white allies come up and start speaking out against uh, some of these, against white supremacy that we're seeing up into the present day. Um, and also, if you're interested in giving money to different land trusts, native owned land trusts, so Amamutsun um, has a great land trust, Agorate, in um, the Bay Area, and wherever you're at. I think that's also a way of moving past the acknowledgement base. So, sorry, I just saw those questions and wanted to briefly address them. Thank you so much, Brittany. I'll just, um, I'll add like a, a, a thought about um, process. Um, so you, you, um, Gwinnell, you were asking about books. There's like so many, so many out there. Just Google, <laughs> like any community you want to understand. We have been writing about our truths forever. Um, and so I want to think, I want to plant a seed of practice. What does it look like to decolonize and make your bookshelf anti-racist? Like, what would it look like if every single book you read this next year was by an indigenous or person of color or black person? Like, just make that choice. You can make that choice right now. And, and you, can, you can change these practices in your daily life. Um, and um, Brittany, thank you so much for getting to the questions in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks. Yeah, and folks have already brought up really great resources. There's tons of great work out there. Um, so I guess I'm just, because I'm perhaps the lone person from not California on the panel, I think I'll just comment that Oregon, you know, here in Oregon, we're also struggling with and uh, are, like working on the same struggles around land justice and access you are. And a few groups I am are like asking a lot of these same questions. Um, so I'm, I mentioned earlier, I'm part of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. You can look up that. It's a citywide effort that is really trying to embody 
racial equity in its funding and process. So that could be a model for similar efforts in California. Um, I'm also part of a nationwide effort to, to evaluate federal policy like CRP TIP and how it is or is not actually benefiting farmers of color like it's supposed to. But one thing that I'm looking at in part of that evaluation is California's actually recent new uh, Farmer Justice Equity Act. So if you don't know about that, look at it. I don't know if it's working as intended, part of it's an important research question, I think. Um, and then locally, the Oregon, uh, sorry, OCFS and Oregon Community Food Systems Network has a series of food charter videos where a lot of local orgs in Oregon, many BIPOC led, created videos about their work and how OCFSN can better support it that I think is helpful for particularly white led orgs in Oregon to look at, but maybe a model for you all to look at as like how we might better center justice and kind of local food systems work in Oregon. So those are just some, some ways that to recognize that our work's kind of bigger than our own states. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us to provide that broader context. Um, and yeah, I know we're slightly over time um, and I really appreciate everyone's participation. Um, I also just want to say that, um, as Sonia mentioned in the beginning, we're going to be continuing this conversation on Thursday, December 9th. And, um, we have uh, one of our panelists will be from an indigenous led land trust. And um, so we'll be able to really look at these solutions, um, at, you know, in a little bit um, greater, greater depth. So um, thank you so much to our panelists. There's a link to the feedback survey for this webinar that was dropped into the chat. So if you could please um, complete that and um, yeah, again, just a lot of gratitude for everyone's participation and especially to our panelists for, for sharing um, with us today. Thank you all so much. That was very deep and yeah, really, really leaves a lot of food for thought. Thank you. <laughs>